impact in our lives already in many respects. But one of the topics, one of the key topics of this webinar is ensuring that we address what is real and what isn't when it comes to AI in the medical imaging field, right? So the majority of the people uh, attending this webinar, myself, Dr. Peter Chang, you know, we're all very focused on the imaging world. And so that's going to be the, the prism uh, that we use to look at what AI is doing for us. But the reason it's time for AI to deliver is that we need it. You know, we, we need some real technologies, not some pie in the sky technology that someday may become useful to us. Uh, it's time for the rubber to meet the road. And this is the time that we live in. Uh, Taylor, can you uh, go to the first slide, please? So uh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Florent St. Clair. I'm the Executive Vice President for DICOM Systems. I've been in the imaging business since 1997, uh, at the time that OpenMRI was uh, kind of the novelty in the imaging market. Uh, I've seen pretty much uh, all of the uh, cycle of uh, adoption of PACS, uh, the down cycle of PACS, the replacement market of PACS, the birth of the VNA market, the birth of the AI market in imaging. And um, I will let Dr. Peter Chang introduce himself uh, in his own right. Thank you, Florent. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you all uh, to, to really dissect and, and kind of reflect on, again, these very unusual times uh, we have among us. Again, my name is Peter. Uh, I have a, a bit of an unusual hybrid background. Uh, I am, in fact, a physician by training. Uh, so a practicing neuroradiologist at the University of California, Irvine. I am also a data scientist and software engineer. Uh, we spent about a decade working specifically in machine learning, uh, in imaging, with a very uh, particular focus on deep learning in the past five or six years or so. Um, in that capacity, I lead the AI Center uh, of Research here at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, and of course, I'm co-founder of, of Avancina CI, AI, I'm sorry, which uh, looks essentially to take some of these tools that we're thinking about in the research realm and, and, and trying to understand how to best translate um, some of this work into real life tools um, that can be used widely across the world. Um, and so I think that's a sort of a unique background that I have. And, and in some ways, I find that that perspective of understanding the different domains uh, is in fact critical with the, the way that AI has evolved and changed in our field in, in such a short period of time. Um, I think you do have to understand the sort of the, the perspectives of those very uh, different uh, uh, sort of roles that I play. Um, and so that's just my background. Uh, again, very, very happy to be here with you all today. Well, as the audience can see, we like to invite uh, underachievers to do <laughs> webinars with us. Thank you so much for making yourself available. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So I think it's appropriate for us to acknowledge uh, the people that are making it possible for us to even have the focus today to be in this webinar. There are a lot of people out there that, are, that don't have the luxury or leisure of um, learning and being a part of a, a, an interesting dialogue like we're having today. And these are our healthcare workers, um, all of the people that really keep us going every day that are putting themselves in harm's way uh, to allow us to continue to do our work. And so I feel very fortunate to be here and I want to make sure we thank uh, everyone around us uh, for their contribution to our well-being. Taylor, next slide, please. So um, this wouldn't be a DICOM systems webinar without a mention of um, at least, you know, some pleasure in, in, in the wine industry, right? So those of you who know us, uh, we have a passion not just for software, but also for uh, good wine. And our company being a Silicon Valley company, we're very close to Napa Valley. And we produce a corporate blend that is not for sale. This is not a sales pitch for the wine. You can't buy it. But uh, those of you who uh, submit some thought-provoking questions and meaningful questions that uh, really get this uh, dialogue going between Dr. Chang and myself, uh, we'll be rewarded with a bottle of our 2017 Unifier Q2. 
Cabernet blend uh, from uh, the heart of Napa Valley. It's a, so those of you who came to our party at the RSNA show last year uh, got to taste it. Uh, we unveiled it and we'll ship uh, a bottle of this to you. And the only thing that you need to do is have the most thought provoking and meaningful <laughs> questions submitted to this webinar. Next slide, please. So speaking of um, very simple housekeeping, your questions can be submitted uh, in the Q&A panel. Uh, please do so ahead of time. You don't need to wait until the end of the webinar to do so. Um, I think uh, you know we're all, we all wanna have a, a very productive webinar here. I'm, I'm ready in case somebody invades my, my space here, right? So uh, this is, according to my wife, this is my impression of Kylo Ren. Um, I don't know if you guys agree, this looks like Kylo Ren, I don't know. I, personally, I think it's more like, um, uh, you know, Sub-Zero in Mortal Kombat, but, you know, <laughs> that's my impression. I'm also ready with my Trader Joe's hand sanitizer, and in case somebody sneezes on me, I also have my disinfectant wipes. So everybody's ready. Let's get to our first slide. So first, uh, let's introduce the Avicenna team and, um, and how they fit into this um, topic uh, today. It's a front row center focused company in the AI space, uh, not just because of their name, uh, but uh, because of their focus in the imaging space uh, and uh, the intersection of AI and imaging. So Dr. Chang, please do the honors and introduce your company to us. Absolutely. So uh, obviously AI is in fact uh, one of the several imaging based deep learning AI companies uh, that exist out there today. Um, while there is a uh, certainly a world of different applications that we can think about building and, and that we are a part of, there is a specific emphasis, at least early on, uh, on emergency triage tools. So things that can help uh, physicians in the front lines uh, in the emergency room. Uh, do their job faster and, and more objectively. Uh, certainly, we've uh, had a, a, a variety of focuses early on within the ER world. Um, stroke imaging is, in fact, our first uh, sort of portfolio of tools, in part because stroke is something that we've looked for computer-assisted diagnosis to help us with as physicians already for many years. So before AI really hit the scene, um, hospitals were already spending quite a bit of money um, trying to optimize this part uh, of care. It's a, it's a very urgent sort of uh, time sensitive type of diagnosis, as you might imagine. And, and so that's where our initial focus was. But certainly, given the current uh, pandemic and, and the times that we're in, uh, emergency uh, medicine has, has certainly evolved and, and we are uh, quite a bit focused on a number of uh, pulmonary tools, uh, applications to uh, help triage COVID uh, and, and uh, things like that, which we'll talk about, of course, throughout uh, this webinar. But, but certainly it, it goes without saying that um, it, it has become a, a tremendous focus uh, of a lot of our peers uh, and uh, being a company both uh, sort of uh, centered in the United States and in France, which is a, a bit unique for us. We, we do have quite a global perspective um, uh, and, and clearly two areas uh, significantly affected by the current pandemic. Um, it is uh, one of the top priorities right now in our, in our mind. So uh, very interesting statistic there, 90% uh, accuracy on LVO is pretty impressive is that, I mean, that I'm pretty sure is in excess of what a human physician is capable of, right? That's right. Uh, in fact, uh, I would say most of our tools uh, will approach the diagnostic performance of a highly subspecialized radiologist working, for example, in a large academic center like my own, uh, where, you know, where, where really the, the, the standard of care is, is very high. But in fact, as you might imagine, most stroke patients are not treated at centers like our own. They're, they're mostly uh, centers out in the community or, or even tertiary aggregates um, outside of academia. Uh, and in those settings, right, you don't have 24-hour access to subspecialist reads. Um, you need to make a decision right away, and, and that might be made by a clinical ER doc or somebody without a lot of expertise. 
Um, that's just the reality of the world. And, and recognizing that if we can sort of bring the high level of performance and standard of care that we expect to see at the very upper echelons of medicine within the US, if you could democratize that and make it available to the world, um, you know, then we feel like we're, we're doing a good thing. Um, so that's really how we benchmark our tools. We, we really don't release anything unless it's, it's uh, sort of clear that very high uh, benchmark we set for ourselves. So I'm always curious about what is the impetus behind the creation of any company. And so when it comes to Avicenna, what was that motivation? What was that initial use case that essentially sparked uh, the team to come together and for that first algorithm to hit the market? Yeah, well, it was a great, uh, actually, it's a, it's a very interesting constellation of things. Uh, I myself am a neuroradiologist, which means that in my daily practice, um, I interpret brain images, uh, brain CTs, CAT scans, MRIs. Um, and, and so stroke was always at the forefront of my clinical work, even outside of, of AI. Um, and, and you combine that with the existing landscape that I mentioned, which is that uh, in our field, if you look at things uh, that really relied heavily on computer assisted diagnosis before AI, um, stroke initially was, was something that was already very popular. Um, and, uh, and so I had sort of that clinical background and, and expertise as well as a lot of hands-on experience building algorithms. Um, and, and then that's when I sort of met Cyril and, and some of my colleagues out in France. Um, uh, many of, of these team members uh, were uh, part of, uh, and in fact, co-founding uh, Olia Medical. So essentially great uh, pedigree of working in imaging software, um, understanding how computer assisted diagnosis can uh, improve workflow. Um, and so they, they definitely brought some of that existing uh, software design expertise, uh, importantly, clinical in implementation, understanding how tools go from a sort of initial conception all the way through to implementation in the hospital, and some of those regulatory considerations that are absolutely critical. So it's, it's really a team of us that came together with a constellation of, of different uh, sort of uh, expertise and, and uh, domain knowledge to, to really come together and, and create what I find is, is a great, it's a vibrant team. Uh, again, it spans uh, you know, two continents uh, and in a variety of different uh, uh, sort of uh, skill sets and, and personality traits and things. So it's, it's a great pleasure to be working with them. Great. And you work with people with a French accent, which is a definite plus. Right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> so um, thank you for introducing Avicenna to our audience, uh, Peter. And um, we've got actually 10 years on you guys you know we were we were founded uh, 12 years ago uh, in 2008 february 2008 to be precise and uh the the impetus behind the creation of dicom systems was uh, 100 percent uh, teleradiology for the u.s military at the time right uh, the, the the founder of the company dimitri tachilnik and myself used to work together in a different company and uh the entire focus of that company was deploying Telerad equipment to the confines of the battlefield. And so the ability to move massive amounts of imaging data between the war theater and Europe, which was a staging area for wounded soldiers before they would get uh, flown back to the continental US. And so the backdrop for our experience before starting DICOM Systems uh, was that uh, intersection of clinical and pure IT and networking and security, right? Because you need to be able to do this in a secure environment with very austere networking environments uh, getting in the way of uh, the mission uh, of the, the wounded soldier, right? So we uh, decided that we wanted to apply that experience and that um, know-how in the civilian uh, area. And uh, we started DICOM Systems as a way to essentially become um, IT focused for imaging, right? We saw a great need to support the uh, unsung heroes of medical workflows, the PACS admins, the network admins, the IT directors, you know, people who were expected to maintain these workflows for the physicians, for the patients, for the technologists. And uh, so we essentially became like a Cisco router for radiology, and that was the impetus for the creation of the company. So we, we built this as 
as an appliance that has become the Swiss Army knife for many imaging departments uh, around the world. Uh, we actually have a presence in all time zones. Uh, we're in Europe. We have some resellers such as uh, Sector Packs, Infinite Packs, uh, Cerner. They all resell our technology around the world. And uh, we serve a pretty wide variety of customers that um, have increasingly um, expected us to play a role in their adoption of AI, right? So since we are the plumbing that's bringing all these images to and from uh, the most vital parts of the imaging workflow, uh, we, we've been approached by many customers who have said, listen, all our images are coming through you already. Uh, we want your help for us to adopt this AI thing, which has been a real conundrum for many healthcare providers, right? How do I adopt and deploy and utilize this extremely valuable technology in my current environment, right? So we'll talk about this a little bit later uh, in this presentation, but suffice it to say that our technology, you know, our, our focus really is to be the support mechanism for the physicians and for the, uh, the important mission of uh, medical imaging. Next slide, please. So let's talk about the backdrop for this conversation, right? Uh, when, we, when we actually started planning for this webinar, this was before March of 2020, right? In a world that is essentially unrecognizable now, right? So we, we've all had uh, to essentially take a crash course in, um, you know, what does it mean to flatten a curve? Uh, you know, it's affected all of our lives and especially the lives of our customers, our radiology customers. Uh, we've, we've done some uh, informal surveying of some of our largest radiology customers, and we've seen numbers anywhere from 40 to 80% decreases in imaging study volume, which is, you know, essentially a cratering of a business environment for many of our customers. Uh, yet we're still expected to be there for patients, right? Uh, just because the imaging volume and therefore revenues have decreased doesn't mean that the importance of the mission has diminished with it. And so we are expected, just like physicians and radiologists, to be 100% operational uh, to, to serve um, a market that is in extreme flux. So um, all of these non-urgent procedures that were scheduled for the past couple of months and potentially for the next couple of months still um, are going to come roaring back at some point. And that presents a challenge in and of itself, right? So the first challenge was how do we support all of our IT staff to work from home, right? So if the imaging center is closed, that is a non-issue. We're not operating MRI equipment, but we still have PACs. We still have IT infrastructure that is expected to be up and running. And so now, how do we support our employees working from home when they're dealing with such sensitive data as PHI on a daily basis, right? So uh, when you're in the hospital and you have good control of your environment and your employees go home and use their internet only to watch Netflix, that's not an issue. But when that same internet line is now being used to manage hospital systems, that is a completely different ballgame. And so, you know, we, we've seen this for uh, the, the uh, financial industry, for uh, credit card industry, where all of their um, uh, call centers are hosted in India. Well, guess what? In India, very few of the workers that are in those support centers have their own laptops. <laughs> so when they're all of a sudden expected to work from home, you had to give them something to work with in order to continue being of use to their customers across the world. So, you know, in some cases you had a, essentially a couple of weeks of complete breakdown in processes and no support available uh, for some very important pieces of our society. Um, as these support and call centers were scrambling to find solutions to support their customers. That was maybe not quite as acute in our industry um, because many of us are already used to working um, uh, virtually and, and therefore, you know, setting up VPNs and letting our employees work from home was not as big of a deal, but it did 
provide a bit of a dip in, in productivity. Uh, and so uh, fortunately, it was at a time that imaging volumes were rapidly decreasing and therefore the problem didn't become quite as acute. However, it, it's essentially like you know, the Navy or the Air Force, even if we're not at war necessarily, all of these aircraft and all of these Navy ships, they need to be operational at a moment's notice. And it's the same thing for our imaging infrastructure. And so our customers are expecting uh, a spike in utilization that is potentially um, never been seen before, right? So all of these packs that have been sitting, not necessarily idle, but uh, underutilized, are going to get hit severely when everybody goes back to the imaging center, when all of these non-essential uh, diagnostic procedures are rescheduled and now become real. And so our hospital customers are going to be expected to be ready at a moment's notice. Peter, could you give us your um, perspective of that for UCI? How, how is the UC system getting ready? For, how are you guys coping for it with this work from home thing? Absolutely. Uh, well, I can, I can actually give some concrete numbers from one center and some of our partners. Uh, you know, we're down to about 63, 64% of our uh, traditional volume for this time of the year. Uh, so certainly a, a significant dip. Um, what is a little interesting is that when I talk to my hospital leadership and the other departments in, the, in, you know, in our institution, uh, radiology remains relatively robust compared to other uh, specialties where you know, they're, they're maybe not as diversified as we are, right? They, they have sort of one uh, very specific type of patient population that they care for, and if that patient population uh, dries up, then, then they're affected pretty significantly. Whereas radiology, as you might imagine, again, is, is diversified across every uh, domain specialty. Um, so that's one thing. It's interesting. We, we are definitely down, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, our effect is not nearly as significant as I know my clinical colleagues in other specialties um, have felt. And that 60% number is actually fairly consistent within the Southern California area in, in a lot of our uh, close community hospitals. Um, in, in terms of uh, preparedness, I mean, uh, I, I can't reiterate enough the fact that, uh, you know, radiology on one hand is particularly well poised in some ways, right? The fact that there is a company like DICOM Systems that exists to solve these type of technical problems in our world, right, um, is, is quite remarkable because again, our, our colleagues and other clinical specialties don't have anything like this. So we were certainly ahead of the curve in, in many ways um, and in well, well prepared for, for the crisis. Uh, but quite frankly, even at our institution, as soon as we shifted from a predominantly on-premise to a predominantly at-home uh, sort of teleradiology setup, uh, we very quickly realized within a week that we needed to update uh, our VPN services. Uh, we were seeing significant bottlenecks in uh, transfer of data, um, in caching, in, uh, you know, in, in basically things that we need for, for everyday work. So, you know, it, it, it's true. We've had to make adaptations uh, quite significantly. Um, and, and uh, you know, we're starting to, to solve those problems now. But uh, Anyways, I, I think it's, it's absolutely illustrative. I think uh, the points that you brought up for rent are, are really head on. So what's been the impact on, on telehealth, really? Uh, let, let's go back to the previous slide briefly, Taylor, please. Right, uh, well, so I would say um, uh, the, the teleradiology as, as a specific focus within our radiology department, again, had uh, some initial hiccups early on, but uh, right now, we're actually reasonably effective. Now, several weeks in, um, everything has transitioned well over uh, even some of my teaching duties, right? Because we're an academic hospital, so a significant part of my work involves uh, being able to hands-on mentor my, my residents and my students. Um, that we've all shifted to, to sort of Zoom-based readouts. We're able to broadcast um, sort of radiology images to groups for uh, tumor board, for multidisciplinary conferences. Um, so we've actually done a pretty good job of transitioning. I will say our, our hospital IT has uh, instead primarily been focused on, again, our, all the remainder of our, of our clinical teams who are trying to adopt in some way to telemedicine, um, you know, basically virtual interactions uh, through, through Zoom or through some sort of video conferencing system, uh, you know, trying to diagnose skin conditions through photos. 
um, or, or asking uh, parents to sort of do physical exams on kids to, to get a better assessment of, of whether or not the patient's actually sick enough to, to need to come into the hospital. Um, that part I say is, is, you know, they're in uncharted territories. They're, they're uh, really struggling to figure out how to, to properly adjust um, uh, some of their workflow. So, so again, we had our initial hiccups. Um, I, I think we're in a pretty good uh, place now and, and we are functioning fairly efficiently. Of course, our volume is down, so we'll see what happens uh, when that picks up. Um, but, uh, but certainly telemedicine as a whole has had to uh, evolve quickly. And, and I know that they're still trying to work out um, exactly how they, they see their workload uh, to, to look like in the future. But, but specifically, I mean, I know I have uh, quite a few friends uh, who work in, in telehealth specifically, and one of the keys that have been uh, a, a slow factor, you know, a slowing factor for them in adoption of telehealth, uh, at least on the supply side, is that, you know, the, the lack of reimbursement of some of these um, encounters makes it very difficult for a business model to be built around telehealth. Do you think that this COVID-19 thing is going to turn that around and be uh, a catalyst for that to change from a regulatory and, and financial perspective? Uh, absolutely. That's a, that's a great point. So, I mean, there's, there's actually a couple points to unpack there. Um, one is the fact that uh, while telemedicine has been certainly around for, for many years, it's, it's a technology, um, right, that, that that exists, right? It's, it's really a matter of adoption and some cultural ideas about uh, sort of the optimal way to take care of patients. But because of the coronavirus and, and our current uh, sort of limitations, um, you know, that type of work has, has completely uh, uh, been uh, pushed forward very rapidly. Um, we're seeing adoption now in places where, uh, you know, initially there was a lot of hesitation or, or people were on the fence. Um, and, and yeah, reimbursement actually, like that, that, that is a, <laughs> that's a significant part of, of what we do, being able to capture uh, what you're doing uh, in, in a way that fits within the paradigm of how physicians are reimbursed, right? Everything needs to match up with certain codes uh, and uh, be, be billable. Um, I think right now, to be honest, my colleagues, as, as far as I understand, uh, they're doing this and they're, they're doing it with the understanding that the reimbursements aren't going to be there. Um, and, and it's just a reality of the situation and, and they're doing it for, uh, you know, uh, to, to keep themselves safe and for the sake of trying to take care of patients the best they can, um, that the reimbursement issue is something that, that is a limitation and, and will need to be addressed. But again, with, with the fact that the coronavirus has expedited the timeline for many of these things, um, as, as we will see later on in these slides, um, I, I think that uh, the reimbursement issue too can, can be overcome quickly. Great. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So there is a, a very interesting aspect of this conversation that I'd like to go over, and that is um, not just in telehealth, but in, especially in AI, um, you know, getting things through the FDA, getting things developed, uh, especially getting peer review, getting published, uh, you know, papers published, proving the effectiveness of an algorithm. You know, all of those things take an, an enormous amount of time and resources. And I, I feel like we should go over what coronavirus has provided as an opportunity for us to accelerate some of these processes and, and, and provide the value inherent in AI more rapidly to the marketplace in real time. And so, how is Avicenna going through this and how is this acceleration taking place for you? Right, and that's, this is actually a very interesting um, sort of silver lining, if you will, uh, despite all the negative effects of, of COVID that we're all aware of. Um, it has interestingly become a, a, a very promising opportunity uh, in, in some ways to expedite the development and integration of, of new tools related to COVID. Um, in other words, you know, I, it, where I am in both the university and, and on the uh, obviously in the side of things, um, I get presented with numerous applications all the time. Everyone says, you know, let's build a tool to do this, let's build a tool to do that. Um, and I'm usually, you know, have a he heavy dose of skepticism when I first take on these projects. I think, you know, on one hand, certainly there's a lot of 
opportunity and the application could be very beneficial. But I think of all the logistic barriers that are inevitable when you start to, to work on these type of projects. And so when, when COVID-19 started to, to pick up, I, I got plenty of these applications on my plate as well. People thinking that, you know, I have this data or, or I have this need. Could you, could you come and build a tool to, to, you know, address some of these concerns? And I said, all right, let's take a look at it. You know, I'll, I'll put in a few IRBs. I'll maybe put in for a few grants and we'll see where it goes, right? Um, and in actually very short order, what we saw was that uh, while there were delays in other non-COVID related work, um, anything that had even a small likelihood of benefit to a COVID patient would immediately become expedited. Um, so things like funding, right? Trying to get money to even start a research project, um, which, which as some of you know, could be very challenging. Um, you know, the, the government, the NIH has released over $60 million uh, of funding for imaging specific research, right? Not just general COVID research, but imaging specific COVID research. Uh, that's a significant amount to, in such a short period of time. Uh, within the UC system, we've had internal grants. Uh, we've raised over $120,000 already through funding in, in two to three weeks uh, on, on our various projects. And so that, that is, I mean, that just speaks volumes to the way that, uh, you know, new, new clearance pathways have been put in, new regulatory and approval guidelines have been enacted to expedite the process. Um, you know, the, the, the speed at which we can move is, is actually quite impressive. Um, and, and I think in some ways, right, when, when you think about AI, uh, there were a lot of individuals, a lot of clinicians who may have initially been on the fence and, and in many ways rightfully so about, uh, you know, wanting to know if, if AI was ready for prime time, right? And, and, and there were struggles to, to get adoption. Uh, but now with, with the opportunity of COVID, we're seeing that, uh, you know, people are willing to take risks, right? Um, you have a lot of technology at your fingertips and, and AI now is, is just so rapid and so quick in, in adapting and, and, and sort of uh, uh, presenting itself as a solution to this problem that people are now just willing to, to see where it goes, right? And we're, we're open, we're candid. We're not saying that the tools re released will, will certainly be, uh, you know, the end all be all for, for diagnosis. We're, we're saying that this is a one piece of the puzzle. We're happy to contribute it. Um, we're willing to take feedback and we're willing to work with you together to improve our, our, our solutions. And that's in fact, in my mind, right, the right way that, that AI should be developed. Um, and so in some ways we're, we're seeing now uh, for, for the first time places where we had no footprints and, and, and very little interaction uh, and, and buy-in uh, now coming to the table and being very interested uh, to see what could, be, what could be done. Well, could you address um kind of a cognitive dissonance that has come up recently is that yes urgency urgency equal accelerated adoption of technology uh you know more uh tolerance for risk and things like that but apparently COVID-19 is not one of those low-hanging fruits for AI uh, one of my uh, radiologists uh, colleagues uh, recently commented to me that you know out of all the algorithms that they're looking at the ones that can be helpful to them for COVID are not helpful because they've seen so many of them already. As radiologists, they feel like they already know what they're looking at immediately. And AI is really not necessary in that sense. So what, what's real here? That's right. So I think um, right with every new technology, you've, you've got to very critically assess um, the types of things that you can expect to solve and, and to have a realistic outlook right? when you're, when you're setting out on, on building these tools. For COVID, uh, I think without question, if I, if I take off my AI hat and look at it from a clinician's perspective, right, um, the ABR and, and all of our governing radiology bodies have all agreed that COVID is, for the most part, not an imaging problem, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a diagnosis that can be made primarily on clinical features um, and laboratory testing, and imaging, uh, if, if at all, will play an adjunctive role. Um, and that's, that's really the case in, in most of our work too, right? So in fact, this, this image here is quite representative on the right side of the screen. Um, our very first application um, that we were asked to build uh, was in fact a predictive analytics tool that just took a lot of uh, sort of common clinical features, uh, you know, patient demographic comorbidities uh, and some lab values and tried to provide a more nuanced prediction of 
complication or need for escalated care. Um, so a tool really that was outside of radiology, I know we're radiologists and we sort of want to inject that directly into the, into the mix, but in fact, these non-imaging tools are certainly things that we uh, looked at first and have the greatest impact. Um, nonetheless, there's a lot of interest in, in the radiology field. And so the way I oftentimes think about it is if you're, you're looking to build an imaging-based tool and you're asking yourself, is AI, uh, is, it, is it capable? Is it, is it uh, likely to succeed in solving this problem? Um, the way I think about it is, are you trying to do something that a human can do easily? Or are you trying to do something that I as a radiologist could, could struggle with? Um, and while it's certainly possible that AI can do things that a, a human can, can, uh, would never be able to do, the reality is that the majority, the vast majority of all the tools we see being built are merely replicating a, an expert's uh, a sort of skill set. So um, not trivial in any sense. Again, there are plenty of non-experts that would benefit from having an expert at their side, um, you know, holding their hand through the diagnostic process. But without question, these are, uh, you know, if, if a human is, is not going to be able to reliably perform this task, I would say for the most part, we haven't seen too many breakthroughs of AI uh, being able to overcome that. Um, and, and I think we, you know, there's, there's some slides later on, on on what COVID can do and, and can't do uh, and, and some of the applications we're, we're trying to uh, uh, look at. So uh, maybe we can, we could sort of focus on those uh, discussions later. But, but I think without question, that's, that's an initial first thing to think about and, and you know, prevent ourselves from getting too carried away about AI and, and its possibilities. Okay. Uh, let's do a quick time check. I think uh, we have 20 minutes left in this uh, webinar with our audience. So I wanna be mindful of everybody's time. Uh, let's, let's move to our next uh, slide, please. So, Let's talk about some real use cases that your uh, your software, your Avicenna uh, algorithms are able to quickly be uh, very uh, useful. That's right. So in line with trying to identify uh, sort of simple yet effective things that, that AI can solve, um, we have a number of applications focused on identifying viral pneumonia. Right? So we're not trying to go out and predict different types of viral pneumonia, which are very, very, very challenging for human experts to do. We're simply looking to find classic signs and symptoms that would make a physician think that the patient has an infection. Um, and we have sort of correlate tools on both x-ray and CT for this purpose. Um, we're not, uh, again, recommending that everyone go out and get a CT scan to uh, diagnosis, diagnose coronavirus. However, if you're in a situation where uh, testing could be delayed and you just need some immediate feedback, right, a, a patient that comes in with the classic features of coronavirus with the corresponding uh, imaging findings shown here, uh, assisted in, in part by AI, um, that in fact could be a, a sort of a, a nice initial uh, use case for AI tools in, in this kind of disease process. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's interesting that uh, patients that present with um, the uh, viral pneumonia symptoms are assumed to be uh, coronavirus patients, right? That's right. I think um, fortunately, testing has become a little bit more prevalent uh, uh, presently as opposed to several weeks prior, but it's still the case currently that if a patient comes into the hospital with classic uh, features of pneumonia, uh, and that uh, if, if you get an imaging test and it comes back before any other uh, uh, sort of confirmatory diagnosis, um, that as long as those classic signs are there in our hospital and many other hospitals, the patient will be assumed to have coronavirus until proven otherwise. Right, you start taking those precautions. You start uh, preparing the patient potentially for escalated care, uh, for transfer to the ICU. Um, these type of things, uh, you know, the, the decisions are being made in advance, uh, in part due to imaging. So guilty until proven innocent, right? Right, which you know, I think given the current situation, is, is uh, a reasonable thing to do. Uh, again, the, the reason that hospitals are operating at 50% capacity uh, is in part due to elective procedures, but also in part due to the fact that they want to ensure they have maximum capacity to treat coronavirus as early uh, and as aggressively as possible. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, let's move on to our next slide, please. 
So let's talk about where the rubber meets the road. Um, so the, the technology that Avicenna and countless uh, companies that are developing AI around the world, one of the major challenges that they've encountered is how do I make this technology available to end users effectively, right? One of the major challenges is that many of these companies host their AI in a cloud, whether it's uh, Google or AWS or Microsoft or some other cloud provider, the, the best way for these companies to operate is to not have their own IT infrastructure and host their IP in a cloud. And that presents a built-in barrier for many healthcare providers who are either unwilling or even unable to adopt cloud-based technology because of procedure or security or you know, the InfoSec team needing to vet the solution and, and making sure that we're not introducing any vulnerabilities in uh, when it comes to PHI. And so one of the challenges as an IT focused company in medical imaging, DICOM Systems, was approached pretty early on by several large customers who were wanting to adopt AI, but just didn't have an effective way to do so, right? So um, the fact that they had already vetted our technology and we were already powering their workflows, whether in cloud or on-prem, made it a natural place for them to want to connect AI and, and consume the AI. And so we built what is essentially um, a standards-based orchestrator of workflows to enable our hospital customers to adopt the AI algorithms that they're truly needing to adopt, whether it's COVID related or not, right? Any AI that uh, they are interested in uh, adopting, they're gonna need to have an effective way to deploy that. And so uh, looking at this diagram, you can see there is an upper portion that is cloud-based and a lower portion that is on-prem. And, but the process is essentially the same, right? It's 100% vendor neutral. We uh, are using 100% uh, st industry standards. We're using RESTful APIs, DICOM Web and Fire to uh, implement these kinds of workflows. And so it's pretty simple. The images are coming in to our server whether our server is hosted in cloud or on-prem, it's going to go through a filtering mechanism. And if the images that are coming through correspond to uh, red flags uh, or just flags that we're looking for to run the images through a specific algorithm, we are now able to dockerize these various AI algorithms in cloud or on-prem uh, to do their job and send us results back. And so our intent here is to standardize the way that our healthcare customers are able to uh, adopt AI and consume the results of AI, right? So you have the supply side, that's the traditional imaging process. The images are coming through our routers. We flag the images for various uh, features. And then uh, depending on what flag came up, the filter will actually send the images to a specific Docker. And each of these Dockers has a different mission in life. And so we're able to use the DICOM web standard, Keto RS and Wado RS to uh, get the information, the relevant information to the algorithm. And then the algorithm can use Sto RS, part of the DICOM web standard, to send results back to us. And you know some of those results may be DICOM structured reports that will go straight to uh, be merged into a, a, a DICOM study. Uh, others um, will, uh, like there's a company called Arteris that we work with, their way of uh, displaying results is to send information directly to the dictation system to pre-populate diagnostic reports with the results of the AI, right? So there's different ways to consume the results, but as long as the results that are coming out of those Dockers are industry standards, we're able to absorb them and deliver them in the format that they're supposed to be showing up in, whether it's the PACs or the EHR or the dictation system. So our intent here is to democratize this process, right? Because you've got this tsunami of AI algorithms out there. There's a lot of companies developing new IP every day, venture-backed, university-based, uh, all of this IP somehow 
needs to be absorbed if it, if it has a reason for being, right? So a lot of projects in AI are not necessarily clinically relevant immediately. Maybe they're research projects uh, for a PhD student. Uh, and those are marginally interesting on the clinical side, but many of these clinically relevant AI algorithms need to find a home and a place to be adopted by our healthcare customers. And so we're offering a process, uh, a way to uh, adopt AI that is very simple, very elegant. And, and so we encourage our competitors, our colleagues, uh, you know, companies that are in this space to take uh, a vendor neutral and uh, industry standard based approach to delivering this IP to its rightful place, whether it's the PACs or the EHR that needs to consume the AI. So um, let me uh, turn it over to Dr. Chang here. We're gonna be going into Q&A mode in, in just a minute, uh, but um, what, uh, what are some of the ways that you've seen Avicenna be able to, um, to deploy its IP? I know that the French government um, is adopting some of your AI it's a slightly different place, right? Because you have the Ministry of Health and a very centralized approach to acquiring uh, software in the French government, uh, which is not something that we have here in the US. So how is your IP being deployed out there? Right, um, so I think uh, this slide is, is very illustrative in some ways of the complexities uh, that you really need to, to consider when you're trying to do a large scale deployment, right? So if you have one or two or three tools all right, that's not a huge deal, but, but as you mentioned, there's a tsunami of algorithms out there, right? And if you don't have an efficient way to test 30 or 40 or 50 different tools um, and, and route them with this type of complexity, um, I think there's going to be issues. And, and I think, yeah, you know, if people are, are hesitant to uh, sort of outsource some of this uh, 10 or 15 years ago, certainly with the rise of, of AI, this, this type of infrastructure is needed uh, even more so. And in part because of that complexity, right, we recognize that the distribution is not just a simple, straightforward uh, sort of door-to-door uh, -door type of approach that we might have seen for many years, right? We're, we're not primarily expecting that a hospital will come to us and, and purchase directly. Um, they are going to go through intermediaries, um, people who can provide infrastructures and ecosystems such as this. Uh, to, to do this work. And, and you make a great point that the difference uh, is actually accentuated as you move between countries, right? So uh, in Japan, we cannot get FDA or the Japanese FDA equivalent approval on our own. We, it would actually be impossible. Um, you need to work directly with a Japanese manufacturer, um, in our case, Canon, a, a fantastic partner of ours on multiple levels, um, to, to deploy your tools there, right? Their hospital system, their regulatory process, everything is completely different. Um, and so that makes, again, these type of collaborations ever more uh, important, right? We're really good at one thing, but we really need to find others who are good at what they do uh, and, and really partner together to bring these tools out to a broader audience. Very well. Um, so we have eight minutes left in this webinar with, um, with you. Um, and so I would say um, it's probably time to take some questions. Um, I see a few here that I, I really like, um, and I think we should uh, begin to answer them. So the first question uh, from uh, Larry Atkins, um, very dear old colleague of mine uh, in, uh, in Orange County. Uh, his questions is, is there are about 300 million imaging studies performed in the US per year. How many of those does AI play a clinical role today and what to expect the number to be in 2025? That's a great question. Um, so currently today, the answer to be candid is, is small. Um, the number of FDA cleared tools are, are quite small. And as much as you would like to hear uh, from other companies claiming that have a, a large, you know, several hundred maybe uh, hospital install base, the number of hospitals that are paying money for, it, for an AI tool, not demoing it, not validating it, not just testing it out, the number that are actually paying a subscription fee is extraordinarily low. 
Um, I would say less than 1% of, of our work. Um, at UCI, we, we don't pay for anything, right? We're, we're developing these tools, so we have no need to purchase applications from others. Um, so the answer is that in today it's quite small. Um, however, without question, that number uh, is, is very likely to grow, right? So what I'm saying is most, most institutions have installed some version of initial AI uh, algorithm from company XYZ, and they're doing a vetting process. And in the next few years, uh, as the number of companies uh, sort of consolidates down from several hundred to maybe uh, 50 or, or less, um, and then we see a more uh, solid adoption um, I would say that number could could grow significantly. 2025, five years, uh, you know, I'll throw it out there at, uh, you know, something like 15, 20% uh, of, of all studies, maybe something like that. Interesting. Uh, Larry, thank you for your question. Uh, I'd like to go to uh, Kyle Hansen's question. Uh, thank you for attending, Kyle. It's good to have you with us. Is there a way in this model to design the AI algorithm to learn from the population related to that facility over time? Does AI continue to learn with the specific data or is training only done during development? That's a great, uh, great question. So my last uh, travel before the pandemic lockdown uh, was to sit on a panel at the FDA to talk about this very issue, which is that uh, current applications are only approved and frozen as soon as that approval has been granted. There is no mechanism for continuous relearning. Um, however, the FDA, uh, in part through myself and many of my colleagues, are now well aware that one of the primary benefits is the ability for deep learning to continuously update. In fact, I have a belief that one day there will, there will actually be no tools that are trained generically and then sent out across the world. I, I think that tools will be fine-tuned and customized for every hospital in the country, right? Just, the way, just like the way we customize MRI protocols and CT imaging protocols after they've been vetted by a central vendor, right? Every, we all have our own unique versions. I think AI will move in the exact same direction. As soon as the regulatory agencies have caught up and, and provided us paradigms, I, I think that will be the reality. Uh, so, uh, 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 an interesting thought-provoking question came up that I've been wondering as well um, is different, different types of data um, and the ability to correlate it. Uh, so one question from uh, Lena is, can we integrate imaging and non-imaging based AI tools parallel uh, for COVID-19? I, I think it's, it's relevant for other applications as well, but uh, can we get away from the siloed thinking that AI is only applicable to imaging versus uh, lab results versus some other discipline. That's right. I, in fact, another key advantage of deep learning is the flexibility in the type of inputs you can work with. So as opposed to almost all traditional techniques where combining imaging and non-imaging data in a single algorithm could be extraordinarily challenging, uh, it's, it's actually very straightforward with deep learning algorithms to do that. And in fact, all of our work now, after our initial early low-hanging fruit wins, it is in fact to combine non-imaging and imaging data in the prognostics of, of coronavirus. And again, that ex extends without question to, to many non-COVID applications. Interesting question. Uh, thank you, Lena. Um, another interesting question from uh, Brian Schnapp. Uh, with the tsunami of AI algorithms approaching, Actually, I, I, I'd be um, tempted to say that the tsunami has already uh, submerged us, but with the tsunami of AI algorithms approaching, will we need AI to help determine the best algorithm for a particular exam? Sounds silly, but how will radiologists truly harness the power of AI without being overwhelmed? That's another great question. Uh, so there, are, there is actually quite a bit of work in the field now uh, in, in the domain of ensemble learning and ensemble prediction. So the idea there is that there is no one algorithm that's the best, right? Um, maybe there's a ensemble or a team of 50 algorithms that do the same similar task and that the correct weighting of those 50 algorithms is different from, from hospital to hospital, or even different times of the year, or different uh, underlying patient demographics. Um, and and that, that is in fact a, a real uh, a type of implementation people have thought about. Um, maybe you do need AI to coordinate the big tsunami of other AIs that are out there. Um, and, and actually, all of the initial work suggests that those type of approaches are more robust and, and better than the traditional model. 
Um, so in fact, I, I do see that as a, as a definite realistic possibility in the future. So um, I, I'm being informed by our marketing team that we'll need to go over time. And I do want to go over time to answer these questions because we have actually quite a few of them. Apparently a lot of people like good red wine. So this is really cool. <laughs> so <laughs> let's uh, go through some, some more of these questions. Uh, Cam Hosen, uh, how would you envision an AI that human and machine would work together where you can have an explainable AI. These are images that are anonymously, that are anonymous so many people could view them. So in other words, crowdsource, you're talking about crowdsourcing, I think, uh, this process. And it's a very good question, but I actually have seen this in action at Stanford. Uh, there is actually a, a worldwide group of radiologists, I think it's called a swarm, where you have multiple radiologists looking at the same images simultaneously and depending on what opinion they emit, you have um, a percentage of certainty that that image contains a certain disease. Um, and I think the, the swarming approach is one that is not quite ready for major production yet, but I think it's promising. But I, I think this uh, crowdsourcing process is actually uh, a very smart way to go about this. Yeah, in fact, while it might not be ready for prime time on the sort of implementation side of things, uh, in, the, in the domain of annotating data, right, trying to get those ground truth results from these very large training data sets, uh, in fact, there are a few startups that I work with that, that specialize in that, right? So maybe, maybe one uh, or two or three individuals from the public uh, sort of a, a lay person may not provide you with great ground truth for these complicated medical diagnoses. But if you had 100 or 200 different people each annotate all these images, well, it turns out that the general overall trends, the, the dominant signal amongst all that data tends to be quite good. Um, and so that is one creative way to annotate uh, and, and provide that ground truth that the AI uh, needs uh, for, for, for development. Mm -hmm. Um, very interesting uh, uh, and thought-provoking. Uh, I think we're going to run out of wine because uh, <laughs> we have a lot of really good questions here. Um, another uh, interesting uh, perspective on this is, are there any plans to integrate with pathology, cardiology platforms, any pros and cons with those? Um, I'll take part of this question, Peter, and I'll let you answer sure. from a clinical perspective. So absolutely, uh, you know, pathology, cardiology, radiology, uh, you know, there's AI needs to somehow integrate aspects, all aspects of diagnostics uh, in order to become uh, more intelligent. I'd say that uh, uh, genetic information, uh, genetic, genetic, genetic markers at some point need to become a part of that as well. Uh, and so absolutely, uh, there are plans to integrate that. And the, the key to successfully being able to do that is precisely that uh, all of the vendors that collaborate on this type of thing need to use industry standards, which is what we're proposing, right? Using DICOM Web and uh, FIRE to marry those results. But absolutely, there should be uh, collaboration between these various diagnosis um, uh, uh, ways to, to, to run the diagnosis for a patient. Go ahead, Peter. That's right. I completely agree with that. Um, in fact, radiology has a head start because we've been archiving data digitally for so long. Uh, but if you look at our colleagues in, in again, cardiology, uh, ophthalmology, pathology, um, they are all starting to do the exact same thing. They're, they're basically where we were maybe 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, in fact, the, the uh, imaging archiving system for ophthalmology has been dubbed the IPACS. Um, so, uh, in fact, they're borrowing a lot of the ideas that, that we've presented. And I think that's actually good, right? We're, we're actually starting to think about cross-domain uh, standards, ways that we can integrate uh, imaging data from various different sources all together uh, uh, for, for this type of work. And so I think, without question, it's, it's a very critical, uh, uh, you know, rapidly developing field. I also like to point out that I think pathology is even more right. You know, uh, we don't have a lot of digital pathology data yet, but otherwise the type of diagnosis you make in pathology is perfect uh, for AI. It's, it's much more amenable than, than even in radiology. Um, so without question, these are, these are tremendous opportunities. Yeah, one of our close partners is actually a, one, one of the pioneers in pathology packs, 
uh, and you know, Sectra has a lot of very successful implementations already, especially in Europe, of digital pathology. And I think uh, collaborating with them, uh, with their customers' data, is going to be a key, uh, you know, to creating some uh, pioneering solutions for that. That's right. Um, our friend Craig Strasshofer from Stanford Healthcare is asking, uh, what's the difference between a detection algorithm and AI? <laughs> Uh, well, those are two very broad categories of things in my mind. So you have, it's sort of like a Venn diagram, right? Detection algorithms in my mind are really anything, uh, any, anything in the history of computer assisted diagnosis where we're trying to augment, you know, the, the capacity of a human reader in some way. Um, AI in my mind, of course, that's a very broad and, and oftentimes charged term as well. But I think most oftentimes when people describe AI, they're talking about the most recent generation of deep learning based uh, machine learning type tools. And, and so there's an intersection there, right? So there's some tools, uh, the types of applications you're going to see in the past one or two years that are going to be heavily driven by what we call AI. So deep learning or machine learning type techniques. But again, there's, they're, they're, they also live in different worlds. And, and I would say if, if you're look, thinking about a tool that's more than two years old at this point, um, that's probably going to be in the, in the prior category of a more traditional computer-aided um, detection or, or diagnosis type of tool. Great. That's an important distinction to make, right? Because a lot of people have been arguing that, you know, AI has been around for a long time, you know, CAD and mammography. For that's example. right. And, and so that is true. But those are, they definitely predate the deep learning approach uh, for AI development. That's right. I, I think the biggest difference really is, is in terms of flexibility and scale, right? So if I was to build a traditional CAD device uh, five or 10 years ago, I would be training that model on a, maybe a few hundred cases maximum. And my submission to the FDA would be a small cohort of maybe 50 or 100 cases. Um, whereas the, the new generation of deep learning tools, right, we're, we're looking at data sets that are at least 10,000, oftentimes 50,000, 100,000 cases, um, and we're validating on, on every single exam, right? The FDA is stipulating that if you want to put a deep learning th tool through uh, clearance, you have to prove that it works for every single case that's coming off the scanner because that's how you're marketing it. Um, so it's just a sort of a, a slight difference now in, in scale as well. Okay. Um, uh, another interesting aspect is uh, false positives and false negatives, right? So Margarita Arango is asking, are there AI algorithms able to predict a bad prognosis for COVID? Yes, uh, good question. <laughs> it turns out that uh, all of our prognostic work, um, so tools that actually can predict the future in COVID are in the non-imaging domain. Uh, but, but we do have promising tools. So uh, we have a, a, a live tool that we're using at UCI, uh, which we built based on a number of clinical covariates. Uh, in fact, it's a total of 13 features now. So things like the patient's age, um, their, their comorbidities, uh, certain lab values. And we can predict uh, with over 90% accuracy when the patient comes into the hospital, whether that patient will need an ICU bed or need ventilation, right? So basically, do they need something special to occur to them right away to prevent complications? Um, and again, those, that, that tool actually is, is recently validated, um, though built here in California, we've tested it at Emory uh, in Atlanta and in Columbia in New York City, um, both with, with great results. And I'm hoping to put a public URL out there as, as soon as we can. Right now, it's just an internal UCI tool, but, uh, you know, within a week, we should have it on Amazon and we hope to put it out there in the world. Great, um, and we do have a couple of more questions and since we've been over, we've gone over time, uh, we may as well go through that, right? So uh, Darren, Darren Lehman is asking, how can AI be used proactively to determine human disease risks relative to the nearly 1 million unknown animal viruses? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I missed that one. Can you repeat it real quick? How can AI be used proactively to determine human disease risk relative to the nearly 1 million unknown animal viruses? In other words, there's a lot of viruses out there that could jump mm -hmm. to humans and which ones based on maybe genetic markers in COVID could we correlate and say, you know what, these other 
uh, animal viruses could potentially become a threat. That's and right. That's, that's actually a great question, Darren. <laughs> uh, I, I, I've got it now. So I would say there is a very large category of AI applications that go into uh, what I dub these, these virtual experiments, if you will, right? We have, uh, it, particularly in, in pharmaceutical discovery, we have a lot of historic data based on certain experiments that have been done to test whether a number of reagents can be beneficial in a number of, uh, of certain disease processes. But the cost of doing that experiment is very high, right? So the idea is if AI has enough data, could it go ahead and predict the expected results of, of millions of additional permutations of experiments? Um, and in fact, it, it can, it's done very well in these type of efforts. Um, in, in fact, AI has completely transformed the pharmaceutical in industry in the past few years. And a very similar type of, uh, of experimental setup, you might imagine, could be the case here. So, um, right, we have a, a million plus, as you describe, animal viruses. And, and given some existing known data of a small fraction of those uh, and how those interact with human proteins and, and human disease uh, entities, um, you can, in fact, train an AI algorithm to then run that risk model prediction on all the other known viruses that exist. Um, and, and with reasonable certainty, you can winnow down that list to a couple of very high uh, likelihood candidate viruses that need sort of further, uh, sort of further experimentation. So, so I agree that that is definitely a very interesting but, but practical approach that has been taken. Yeah, I think, I mean, we're living in a, an extremely interesting time. Uh, you know, unfortunate circumstances, but very interesting. And I think uh, what we're living through currently is going to be a it's going to become known as the great catalyst for a huge amount of human ingenuity and creation uh, and harnessing of AI going forward. Um, we, we do have a couple more questions that are more related to the specifics uh, of what DICOM systems and other AI uh, players have done to integrate with each other. And we'll answer those uh, more directly to the people that, that have asked them. I wanted to keep um, the, the questions in this webinar uh, more educational and, and, and less commercial, if I may. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be answering you more. Um, are there any other uh, topics that you think uh, would be of interest to our audience? Uh, or do you wanna essentially let people go back to their lives and, uh, and thank everybody uh, profusely for making the time to be with us